Hey everyone, we're back in the studio and we have a hardware news recap for the week for you. In addition to all of the other hardware news, it's been a crazy week. In this one, we'll be talking about Alphacool's metal fan, Intel's single slot GPU that is technically between the A380 and the A750 in both price and in theory, the actual GPU silicon. And we'll be going over the backdoor that was found in Gigabyte's motherboards, including how Gigabyte creates a user account on your Windows install without telling or asking you. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly and the CryoSheet graphene pads. These CryoSheets are molecularly stacked in the Z-axis to encourage vertical direct thermal transfer from the IHS to the cooler. CryoSheet pads are made to be easily applicable for a thermal interface and completely avoid paste dryout because it's not paste. It makes them particularly useful for lawn service life systems with minimal maintenance. They come in multiple sizes for suitability on the most common laptops and desktop CPUs, and you can learn more at the Thermal Grizzly Cryo Sheets at the link in the description below. First of all, just a quick Computex debrief for you. We had a ton of awesome collaborations in the last few days of the show. Uh, and honestly, I love the style of content we're able to produce during these shows. It doesn't last forever. It's a temporary style change, but I wanted to give some insight for why we like it so much. First of all, uh, all of the vendors were shocked when they found out that we had published 10 videos in two days, and the team is just three of us for travel. So for this one, it was me, Vitaly, and Mike on the travel team. We don't send any of the content back, so that's your behind-the-scenes insight. Uh, we do it all locally when we're on location, shooting, filming, editing, uh, scripting, all that stuff. It's done in the same place, the same three people. So the ground crew is super lean and efficient, and I'm really proud of the work that our team did because not only was the output volume high, but we managed to keep the quality standard pretty high despite I mean, when you're on the ground for a news show, you're always trading off some quality for just like quick access to information that needs to go up quickly as well because it's something everyone's covering. So um, we were able to keep a kind of cool uh, sort of angle for everything, like with Noctua getting one of their technical people on to talk engineering. But as a reminder, this is always temporary, so it's about three weeks of content like this. We have the last two, we have one more going, and then it's kind of back to normal, but with some improvements. And that's what I wanted to share. So for just sharing some insight, what do these shows allow us to do? They give us inspiration and reinvigorate us to do what we already love doing, except even more of it with new cool stuff coming out. We also come back home with a ton of unique and fun content ideas, and those won't only be in line with what we normally do, but even more advanced. Sometimes these shows allow us new access, like talking to engineers who otherwise wouldn't get to meet us because they have to communicate through PR normally. And the idea formulation here doesn't happen without a change of scenery and a collide of industry minds at a show. This hasn't happened for like four years. So it was awesome talking to people like Wendell, Gordon, Leo, everyone else we ran into, Noctua's technical team, and all the others we work with. And we learned a lot and thought about some challenges in new ways. Of course, it also allows us to see what's coming up in person and experience technology hands-on rather than through press releases. And we get to explore Taipei which is always fun. It was actually Vitaly's first time out there on the team as well, and he and I are both looking forward to going back for some more content. Can't, uh, can't talk about what it is yet, but we have some really unique stuff lined up uh, in the investigation area of things, and one history telling piece, and that's going to require us going back out there. But anyway, uh, other stuff you should be aware of. There was an awesome joint effort that popped up out of nowhere from Wendell from Level 1 Tax where uh, that video is on the channel, but I just asked him, hey, can you come complain about all the RGB and sensor issues where everything's proprietary? He said yes, but also I'd like to work with you to launch Open Pleb. And uh, I, so the, the context for this, I messaged him and he said, yeah, sure, I'll join. And then like six hours later, he, so I have this idea. And, um, and that's something we're actually doing. It's uh, going to be an organization that will hopefully open up licensing, uh, documentation, and knowledge bases for all of these different proprietary solutions to help standardize them a little bit and get pledges from the companies to basically not sue each other for just using the pinout. That's what we want to see. Whether this is successful, I don't know. I mean, it's you're talking about big companies that have a lot of inertia. They have a lot of money invested. It's worked. It worked with open compute in the server market, and that's like much higher stakes. and way more advanced 
technology. So there is a roadmap for this type of thing working, and it's a proven model. We don't know if our version of this will work, working with Wendell and GN uh, combined, but I guess what we're going for here is sort of we're going to try. And if it doesn't work, then at least we tried to be a part of the solution and not just complain. Uh, but I do feel pretty good about it because at least sort of what GN brings to the table is an audience that will listen to me ranting and also a decent relationship with some of the higher up people at some of these smaller companies especially. So I think we can maybe make something happen. And then Wendell brings this massive amount of knowledge and background on how these things have worked in the past. So that's really cool. Go check out that video. There's another note here. We have a content slowdown coming up. So we just produced a ton of stuff. It was like 20 plus videos in two weeks. So we're going to slow it down a little bit. This will probably be in another week or two, but we want to overhaul some of GN's internal systems completely. So that'll be changes to QC pipelines. We want to build production pipelines and methods to get GN extras going in a higher capacity. Planning to overhaul some test benches with new hardware and methodologies. So we're planning to slow down on uploads during this time as a strategic decision to reallocate some of our efforts to build a more stable foundation. And we've done this in the past. I think last time we did this, a lot of you commented when we came back, like, oh, wow, that was really impactful. So we're planning to do that again because we just, if we're publishing multiple times a week, it's really hard to ever actually improve things and you're just trying to maintain. And so we have to have these pauses to still work internally, but uh, maybe a little bit lower hours and just kind of improve stuff and then come back refreshed. So on my end, I need some time to work on some test engineering, patch quants, work on some software, stuff like that. And uh, some team members have time off coming, coming up anyway, so it's good timing for that. But before we hit that period, we have some really unique lab tours from AMD's facility. We never got around to publishing during all the burning motherboards things. So those are done. They're coming up in the next week or so. Uh, and then we have some factory tours and more. So that's the recap for Computex, some of the content we were excited about. Uh, I just, I mean, it's been the first time in four years we've done this. A lot of you never got to see our old coverage. You've seen it now. Hopefully you liked it. And even if you didn't, what I wanted to share here is like, okay, so if you don't like the coverage, at least you understand why we go and how it benefits the whole channel and the health of the channel and the team. And it's not just about like only the news for hands-on at a show. There's all of this knock-on effect stuff, all this inspiration that comes and, and really excites us to work on what we're doing, access to engineers, all of that's very important. And um, I think sometimes people don't really get that part. So that's why I wanted to share. Okay, backdoor and gigabyte motherboards. This will be fun. While we were away at Computex, Gigabyte had the lid blown off of a potential security vulnerability by research company Eclipsium. Specifically, the issue raised was with motherboards automatically downloading and installing Gigabyte's App Center software in an insecure manner. Fundamentally, this is the same thing that Asus does with Armory Crate, which is also bad, uh, and also had exploits that were patched previously and probably has more in there. The firmware, or the BIOS for Gigabyte, has a small binary that automatically installs itself into Windows. It then automatically pulls down the software from Gigabyte's servers. Aside from this being an egregious violation of user trust, this is also concerning because Gigabyte's not the most secure company. They, they had their entire like RMA center breached previously. And also, companies tend to forget about and accidentally abandon these types of servers, and they just become these huge attack vectors. Worse still is that Gigabyte set it up without signature verification of the executable or verification that the remote server providing the files had valid certificates. Gigabyte's own statement lists these changes in its latest BIOSes, so we know this to be fact. The full write-up by Eclipsium doesn't have evidence that this security hole has actually been utilized but does list several other similar situations where it was. The researchers explain how exactly this works, so go check that out if you're curious. But Eclipsium has been compiling a list of all affected motherboard models, which so far has 406 entries at the time of writing. It essentially looks like every motherboard, all the way back to the 500 series chipsets on Intel and 400 on AMD for Gigabyte are affected. The worst case scenario here would be a supply chain attack where a bad actor would be able to plant malicious code within either the binary that loads from BIOS or in the software it pulls down from remote servers. Longer term, there's also the possibility of those URLs being abandoned by Gigabyte later and being co-opted by bad actors, leading then old motherboards to just automatically pull down malware. 
This isn't all, though. People on Twitter immediately started looking into it and found at some point in the install process for Control Center, it secretly creates a user account named GCC underscore file drop. The user account has a password, though, so don't worry, it's secure. The password is GBT123GCC. And that can be used to authenticate any PC that has the software installed. This is obviously a huge problem. We all know that passwords should be 12345. 123 is just insecure. But there's another problem. Anywhere you have network access to other PCs, this could be an attack vector. The user account doesn't have administrative privileges. But for attackers who know what they're doing, that's not much of a hurdle to cause damage. There are two ways you can mitigate this situation. The first one is to immediately update BIOS on your Gigabyte motherboards, and hopefully that just solves it. The second one is you can block URLs targeted by the local executable, and Eclipsium has those listed near the bottom of its press release. Again, the practices of force installing software and making hidden user accounts, they're just gross. That is literally malware. That's what, that is. That's what Gigabyte and Asus are both making when they install this stuff without any kind of user uh, sign off on it whatsoever. And whether that's BIOS or not, it's at least just annoying, if not insecure and concerning. Now, both Asus and Gigabyte have toggles in their BIOS to turn these features completely off. We actually use them on our test systems for Asus. And you should probably go in and disable those before you ever boot or install Windows. The problem with having a toggle that defaults to on is that the user has to know it exists to benefit from turning it off. And they don't want to default it to off because then they wouldn't be able to install their user tracking malware on your system. Either way, the actual best solution would be for motherboard manufacturers to stop doing this. But short of that, you could buy from someone else. Up next, a new Intel single slot GPU. This is in the professional category, but it's part of the Arc family. And this is the Arc Pro A60. So this thing being single slot is already interesting because those are rare now. The shroud is simple with the black and blue coloring. It has a blower fan that's open to draw air in on both sides of the card and push it through the cooler. And it can draw up to 130 watts on a six pin PCIe connector. It'll probably be loud when trying to cool 130 watts, but the PCB itself is relatively short, indicated by the back shot of the card. The Pro A60 has 12 gigabytes of GDDR6 on a 192 bit bus for a bandwidth of 384 gigabytes per second. That's nearly 100 gigabytes per second more than the 4060 Ti, although there's more to it than that. I wonder if this can play Crisis. <laughs> Only gamers know that joke. The GPU die is called the ACMG12, and it's new to the ARC lineup. It sits between the A750 and the A380 in basically every metric. It'll also be available for laptops as the A60M, albeit with only eight gigabytes of memory and a reduced 95 watt peak power. Intel also points out that this GPU will work for basic ray tracing tasks while being able to work in tandem with compute engines or AI accelerators found in the current and upcoming CPUs. This is done with Intel's hypercompute and hyperencode technologies. The rumored price is $175, and compared to the gaming A750, that's not that interesting, because the A750's been anywhere from as low as 200 lately up to 250. But this isn't really meant to be a gaming card, a little bit different, it is cheaper, and as far as professional cards go, it's actually one of the cheapest current generation right now. So, uh, not a bad price for a pro card, considering that AMD and Nvidia have not only abandoned this part of the market for gaming, but also for professional users. Ultimately though, it's aimed at people who want a slim profile card. Apple, up next. The company has a new toolkit for porting games to Mac OS. Normally we don't talk about Apple because the audience that they indoctrinate doesn't really overlap with ours that much, but this time there's something different. The new toolkit offers an emulation environment to run unmodified Windows games on Apple's processors. You can think of it like Wine or Proton for games running on Linux. Apple's emulator is notable since Apple CPUs are ARM designs since the M1 onward and are incompatible with x86 instructions. This allows developers to see their games running on the platform before doing any major work. Apple's developer-focused video for the tool shows the Windows version of the Medium launching and running without any alterations. 
After this, the video shows a stats overlay that's part of a login feature to help developers identify problems that need to be fixed or optimized in the actual port. These stats dump to a log that can be scrutinized later. The emulator tool isn't a free ticket, though, to running any and all games on macOS, as the emulation itself adds a lot of compute overhead that puts a major dent in overall performance. Apple shows this here in the side-by-side, -side, with the unmodified version on the left and the full port running natively on the right. Up next, Microsoft announced that it's ending support for Cortana on Windows 10 and 11, and instead moving to fully integrate its Copilot feature, all the AI trend included, uh, as an assistant within Windows to replace Cortana. Windows Copilot is confusingly using the same name as GitHub Copilot, but Microsoft owns GitHub, so there's probably crossover. Microsoft wants this Copilot to have broad capabilities to change Windows settings, which you'll need the help with since they keep moving them into new tabs that are completely impossible to use, or assist with productivity tasks by processing natural language queries from the user. It'll sit on the taskbar like Cortana does now, but will open a persistent sidebar once activated. From there, you can do almost anything, apparently, with examples including copy and paste. One hell of a feature to list. You just open up the sidebar and type in, please help me copy and paste this thing, and somehow that seems more efficient than just doing it yourself. It can also do more interesting things like find flights or rewrite a section of text for you. In addition to the native capabilities, it'll also have plugins available for connecting to other services like searching the internet with Bing or using LLM capabilities of ChatGPT. Windows Copilot will be available in the preview of Windows 11 sometime this month. We're not sure why Microsoft didn't just add the new features to Cortana because it sounds like it's basically just a more advanced version of the same thing they were trying to do. Probably has to do with branding consistency. Although Cortana was at least a cool nod to gaming with the Halo series. Now at Computex, there were a ton of cool things to look at, and we didn't see them all, despite arriving in Taiwan a whole week in advance of the show. So this section will be a kind of rapid-fire roundup of the relevant stuff in PC hardware that we didn't get to see personally, or if we did, we didn't get a chance to write it up. Uh, Computex, just so you know, it's massive. It takes place across a few different hotels in uh, Taipei area, mostly near 101. And then there's also two convention centers that are multiple floors. Just for perspective, even if you don't know anything about any of these places, we only got to spend time in uh, one of the hotels where most of the meeting suites are and one of the convention centers. So we actually didn't even walk into the other convention hall at all. So we missed anything that was in there. And we still published over 20 videos, and it would have been physically impossible to see any of the other stuff. So there's some cool things to talk about. By the way, my personal favorite video from the show, I think, was probably our InWin Design Center tour. We kind of published it with the title and being about products. So the modular cases, the, it's almost a parody of itself. But we had a different thumbnail originally. and basically to try and boost the performance because I really wanted that video to get views because it's so cool and interesting. Uh, I had to figure out how to get people to click on it while still reflecting the content of the video, i.e. not becoming clickbait. So we put the words big computer, pointed an arrow at the massive computer they were building, and that's the one you should go check out if you haven't seen it. But the actual content for it, in addition to big computer, is the design center tour. And that play, it's so cool to see the behind the scenes of how this stuff is made and designed. We don't really get to see that. So anyway, that was my favorite video. But let's talk about some of the stuff we didn't get to see there but came out. AlphaCool is mostly known for water cooling parts, but uh, this year it showed off a new fan. And that is a metal framed fan. It's worth paying attention to. This is the Apex Stealth from AlphaCool, and it has a zinc frame. So metal frames have been done before, Lee and Lee has done them. Actually, they used to make their fan frames out of aluminum. Uh, but what makes this different is that the fan's motor and the impeller are completely disconnected and decoupled from the frame. AlphaCool claims this results in much lower noise compared to the other fans in the market across the entire RPM range. AlphaCool did this by sandwiching the entire inner plastic fan parts between the outer frame pieces with O-rings. This isolates the vibrations of the actual fan from its mounting. AlphaCool's own charts, if they're accurate, paint an impressive picture of the fan's performance. The noise chart has the fan as the purple line below all the others, and it shows the fan ranging from about 20 dBA at 1250 RPM to about 27 dBA at 2400 RPM. While absolute values are completely useless and totally dependent on test conditions, in this situation, they probably tested all of these things in the same place, 
with the same methods, so at least against themselves, they should be comparable. And that number then for alpha cool is way better than the rest shown. Switching to the airflow graph shows a big jump in performance as well. Next is the Minis Forum EM680 Ultra Mini PC. This thing is tiny. It is 0.25 liters in volume. Uh, it is a micro PC basically because it's only 80 by 80 by 43 millimeters. And for reference, that's similar to a Raspberry Pi case like Silverstone's Pi O2. The EM680 has an 8 core Ryzen 6800U, up to 32 gigabytes of soldered DDR5 memory, and has a PCIe Gen 4 M.2 slot for storage. Mini's Forum is partially addressing cooling by using liquid metal, like it's done for PCs in the past. Hopefully this time they actually put it in there. And there's as much I.O. as you could hope for given the form factor with three USB Type-A ports, two USB 4 Type-C ports, HDMI, a combined audio jack, and a micro SD card reader. There's no dedicated power plug as it uses either of the Type-C ports for power, so you lose one of those. The EM680 is available in three different memory and storage configurations and ranges from $400 to $490. And Cooler Master had a massive amount of products to show off. We didn't make it over there this year. Uh, we went to their HQ in December, so we showed some stuff there. But there's some new things. And Paul from Paul's Hardware had an excellent video from Cooler Master's headquarters for this new stuff. Definitely go check it out. He also had a really cool video that showed some of the like sort of actual culture and behind the scenes of Computex. So like, I mean, what does it look like from ground level, not just zoomed in on the product level? He gives more perspective for the show. I really enjoyed that video. You should watch that. Uh, very different, very fun, and sort of uh, gives a real look at it. But anyway, one of the more interesting things that Paul showed is the next gen 3D VC cooler, which is 3D vapor chamber. And this cooler, uh, it combines a vapor chamber for the cold plate contact with the CPU and does something different by opening up the channel between the heat pipes to the cold plate to sort of integrate them with the vapor chamber. Vaguely, this is similar to the ice giant coolers minus the circulatory element and hopefully more effective. Keeping it with the cooler theme, Cooler Master also had a pretty cool demo setup with its new MA824 Stealth air cooler. The part that made this fun was that they coated it with heat reactive paint. So it provides an interesting look at how the heat, how the energy moves to fully saturate a tower cooler fin stack. And it shows how quickly it moves. While not the most scientific representation, it's actually a super cool demonstration of things. And uh, not sure if they're gonna productize the color changing paint part of it, but they probably should, because uh, that'd just be a neat feature of the product, assuming you're not throwing away a bunch of performance or introducing new problems of some kind. So that was kind of cool to see and uh, is honestly one of the most interesting tech demos I've seen in a long time or something so simple but complex. Keeping with uh, Cooler Master here for one last part, they had some cases there. They were mostly concepts. One of them was a case, ATX case, that allowed motherboard mounting without any screws. So it's a toolless assembly where they sort of snap it into place. Now the open bench table kind of does this, except it's a bench, so it's horizontal, a little different, and the uh, requirement for keeping things tensioned is different. But the idea is just toolless mounting systems. Now, they had another one that was similar to the NR200P Max in that they are planning some semi-built bundles to drive down total cost. Those would include a liquid cooler and a power supply inside the case pre-installed. And like we said, there were a ton of products at Cooler Master's booth. Uh, Kyle Bitwit also had a video showing off some of their cool streaming tech and uh, basically like Stream Deck competitor type products. Not Steam Deck, Stream Deck. So we have to make that differentiation now. But it was a lot of fun. We still have more content coming up. So we've got one more interview with Der Bauer. We have uh, the video with Wendell is posted now. Go check that out. It's awesome. We have a couple of other sort of news pieces from the show. I think there's maybe one more interview. And then that's going to be it. We're kind of back to normal other than the AMD Lab Tours. So. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more as always. Go to store.gamersnexus.net if you want to support our endeavors for all of this type of reporting because we fund all of the flights, hotels, the wages, everything, food, everything that is needed for travel. Uh, we pay for that. And a lot of that is because of our support from our audience. So thank you for the support. Subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.